I'm Lee Brown. This is Crazy Shit in Real Estate. Today, we're a little nerdy, a little less real estate, and a little more financial planning for real estate people or small businesses or, frankly, anybody, because we got a couple good questions you should be asking of your financial advisor. I've got Greg Golf with me in Greenville, South Carolina. So, tile in for the conversation, and I'll see you on the other side. Hey, Lee, how are you? I'm good, Greg. How are you? I'm doing great. Can you hear me all right on my AirPods? I can. You're a little bit fuzzy, but not terrible. Let me see here. And does that say Clemson behind you? It does. Yeah, it does. If you drive through Clemson with your windows down, somebody throw a diploma in the car. (laughs) I know, I know. And I live down in Greenville. Can you hear me better now? Uh, Yeah, a little bit. Okay. Yeah, I apologize. I was trying to get the headphones working. Normally, I just use the audio on my computer and I figured out these AirPods might be a little blurry this morning. So sorry about that. You never Um, never knew which one's going to connect. So you're in Greenville? I live in Greenville. Yep. And um, it's funny, just about every office you go into down here, everyone has the exact same diploma hanging up. It's either that or stupid Gamecocks, which is not Carolina, by the way. Not Carolina, you said? No, they're not Carolina. I have Carolina. Y'all have South Carolina. It's a whole different thing. I did see that. I was reading um, reading a little bit about you, and I thought you went to UNC. I actually grew up in Charlotte, so I had a lot of friends that went to UNC also. Oh, okay. Where'd you grow up? Where'd you go to high school? I went to high school at Providence Day in Charlotte. Oh, you're fancy boy then. I see. Well, I don't know about that. I try not to be, but it's funny. I, I'm proud of Providence Day. I like Providence Day, but it always kind of gets that response. So everyone's like, Providence? I'm like, no, Providence Day. And anyone from there kind of says that. So, Well, that's okay. I mean, it's your parents I feel sorry for because I know how much they paid in tuition. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have an idea, but I try not to ask. You probably shouldn't, I'm but wondering, can you, you, you graduated, you became a CFP, so it obviously paid off. Definitely, definitely. And I'm wondering, I'm sorry, would it be better, do you think, if I switch to my computer audio? Can you if, hear if, me okay? I can hear you, but it's lagging with the video. So change that for me and see if it stops lagging. So is that undergrad at Clemson or graduate too, or you just got your bachelor's? There we go. Muted. Let's see if you unmute now. See what we got. Nope. Sorry about that. Is that better? That's way better. This is how I normally do Zoom meetings. And I didn't want to break the trend because I saw we wanted some headphones. So sorry about that. Well, if I don't tell people that, then they'll be in a Starbucks and I have all of the exterior noise. And that that's terrible because that's when we get terrible feedback on the podcast is with sound. They don't people can get over video, but they can't get over bad sound. Gotcha. Yeah. Well, thanks for having me on. I noticed your podcast on, I think, LinkedIn. I was scrolling down LinkedIn, okay. saw an episode and just started giving it a listen. And I really liked how you had a lot of people on who aren't necessarily just real estate agents, real estate brokers. I noticed you had some people with some different takes on real estate investing and different tools that could be made as well, used as well. So thanks. I mean, it's all over the place, but a lot of my audience is not real estate people. It is consumers who are interested in different things about real estate. So I should also let you know that before you start chatting, a lot of our audience is not practicing in real estate. They are Right. interested in real estate. And so they have lots of different questions to ask and different viewpoints. And so the show is definitely one of the most random ones out there when it comes to guests. Although I think Joe Rogan has me be, but he gets higher profile people than I do. But I'll use the hashtag, yeah, that Greenville, then we'll get picked up on that site. So that's the that's, that's your hot hashtag in Greenville. You know that, right? I do. I do. And I believe my I don't want to give credit where it's not due, but I believe my wife's good friend's father is the one who kind of coined the phrase for Greenville. And she's actually moved up to Charlotte now. I'll throw her name out for her, Alyssa Stone. She's a real estate agent up in Charlotte now. I've seen it. Oh, nice. Seems like she's been in it for a couple of years and taken off doing really well. So uh, So who does she work for? Mm, I'm on the spot there. I don't know. It's all about name recognition. You got to build the name for yourself. And she's clearly doing a good job of that or, or I'd place more weight on that. 
It is, but it's also about your broker affiliation because that's license law and it's where your license hangs. And so this is actually a good reminder for realtors who forget to talk about their firm affiliation. You better make sure you're talking about it so you're in compliance with the Real Estate Commission guidelines and that the consumer public can find you. So it's very important stuff. But yeah, absolutely. Well, give her a search after this and check it out. I oh, actually- I will. Since I'm currently the state president of the North Carolina Association of Realtors, so I'll totally look her up since she's one of my 56,000 members. Absolutely. Absolutely. Awesome. And I actually don't think I've even talked to her about it. I've just noticed her marketing and all online. So she's so doing you could probably job. reach out and say, hey, Greg, because she might need some tax and structure advice. Exactly. Hey, yeah. I mean, has anybody told her about the pass-through entities? Does she know about how she can avoid the self-employment tax, which eats realtors alive? Has anybody told her about that? I hope someone has. I used to do most. That's your wife's best friend. Your wife is going to get you for this. Yeah. So similar to reaching out for this podcast, I admittedly, I'm not as big on reaching out to personal contacts on doing business. I like to kind of throw some knowledge out there that's hopefully helpful for people, give just some free education where I can and anyone who it speaks to, hopefully they find me. If I'm not doing a good enough job talking about this in front of friends and family, then I don't know what I'm doing anyway. But business is going well. So I guess it's been working all right. Of course, since we're recording in the middle of March 2023, of course, the stock markets, the equities markets, the all markets are in quite turmoil right now. So I would think that as a certified financial planner, if your clients aren't calling you, you probably ought to call them because they've got to be panicking right now. So what do you tell people when the markets are really volatile? Because we've been experiencing this volatility for a while. We have been. And Truly, I reach out to them by phone. I reach out to them by newsletter, really, just to get more information in front of them. But really, the consensus at this point is don't buy high and sell low. Let's hang on. We invested your money with a plan. And truly, a lot of clients that I'm working with are in real estate as well. So they're not necessarily feeling as much of the blow because they do know that their money's invested according to long-term goals. Not necessarily all asset classes are down, including real estate in some of the areas where we live, Greenville, Charlotte. Real estate's been doing quite quite well also. So I'm a big supporter of clients who want to do real estate investing, get a little bit more creative. I'll tell you more about it today, but that's a lot of why I left the large brokerage that I used to work for, started my own business to where I'm able to work a little bit more hands-on with these clients and don't necessarily have an issue if money leaves a stock, bond, client portfolio to go buy a piece of real estate if we see an opportunity. It sets me up to be able to make the best recommendations for the clients and support them no matter what opportunity they see. So do you and your wife invest in real estate? We do. Yeah. We bought our first home as soon as we could, which was a, it was actually a condo in Uptown Charlotte. It did really well. Timing was perfect because we sold it right before COVID hit and kind of slowed Uptown Charlotte down. We got a house in Charlotte for a few years. We actually just sold it recently, did well there also. And when I lived in Charlotte, I had an office building that I really, I bought prematurely for my business, but I saw it as a great investment kind of on the the east side of town off Monroe Road, which you've seen all the uh, the change in that area. You know, you start talking about maybe putting a silver line down that way and you see what happens to the property value. So even in my own personal financial plan with my wife, real estate has actually returned the greatest returns. And I love seeing that for our clients as well. But I see so often with real estate investors, including real estate professionals, brokers, agents, they are firm believers in real estate. They also like to keep cash on hand. I see so much where we have just two different ends of the liquidity spectrum. We have maybe a lot of cash sitting in a bank account, waiting for that next real estate deal, don't know when it'll be. And sometimes we'll just leave money sitting in a bank account, getting no interest for years. And then we have real estate, which is illiquid. And typically I just see such a large gap in terms of retirement savings, different stock bond type portfolios that I talked about earlier, where there still is a place for it. It just doesn't have to be your whole portfolio if you're also very capable of investing in real estate yourself. Well, I will say one of the biggest mistakes I've ever had to experience in life was being in real estate during the Great Recession was probably you were probably still in college. When did you graduate from college? 
Oh, it was 2016. Oh my God. Okay. So you were in elementary school. I was, I was in, uh, I was going into high school. Yeah. yeah. So I didn't have anything liquid when the recession hit. And so because we had nothing liquid, we couldn't take advantage of all of the investment opportunities that cropped up. In fact, I had a client in eight, nine, 10, and he only bought $25,000 houses. That was his max. And so yeah. we bought houses all over Charlotte, 25,000 cash. And every one of those is, of course, doing very well right now. And he's just hanging on to them. But you have to have some liquidity to take advantage of that. And of course, I used to have a 76365. So full disclosure, I've lived in yeah. your world. Yeah. And I worked on Wall Street, used to have cocktails at Windows on the World, which was on top of one of the World Trade Center towers before the terrorists took them down. Yeah. And so my financial background goes back a long way. And as a result, when I started seeing all of the inverted yield curves that have been cropping up since 2019, which have been sitting there for no reason, I went a little liquid in 19. And we're still sitting on that liquidity because I'm not putting it into these equities markets right now. The bond market has been a disaster, of course. And so I look at this, I'm like waiting for my investment opportunities. They still haven't cropped up. And so you have this whole uh, mindset of you got to be able to take advantage of things but you also don't want to lose everything you have. It's a hard emotional play to make. So what would you say to an old person like me who's still sitting liquid? I mean, they're, they're money market, but I'm not going to miss my opportunities when they come back and they'll be back at some point because everything's cyclical. Yeah, definitely. I will say you mentioned uh, I'm not responding to the old person comment. I don't think you're I'm not saying you're an old person. I'm a lot older than you are. If we are talking to someone who's who might be older, who might be you know closer to retirement, I would never say get into the equities market right now. Now that said, you mentioned buying real yeah, estate for mining stocks. I am buying mining stocks right now because okay. I think that's a growth play. But that's the one thing I'm playing in. That and funeral home stocks. Hillebrand is one of my favorites. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Right now, I do think that getting into equities is a good place to be. You talk about buying real estate in 08. I think it's a similar comparison to buying equities right now, as long as you can weather the storm. I, I right. still think we have further south to go. So I don't want anyone who needs the money in the short term to listen to this and go go buy equities thinking that's the next play. But yeah, so Asterix, we don't know your situation. This is not financial or investment. Yeah, yeah. This is the conversation, call somebody. <laughs> exactly, exactly. But in terms of a good place to be, I mean, like you said, inverted yield curve over the last few years. I think right now I'm seeing a lot of people flocking into CDs. And I think that's a good play. Short term CDs, if you need the money in the short term. One thing I'll throw out is a lot of people are going to banks right now. I see them going straight to the bank to buy the CD. That's not necessarily the best place to buy it because normally when you go there, you're just basically, if you go to one particular bank, you're just going to see their CDs. That's another part of why I structured my own business. If you come to somebody like me, I can look across the entire spectrum buying the CDs with the highest interest rates. I've seen interest rates a lot higher than what people who are running around shopping CD rates have been able to find at any of the individual banks. But I'll just add, in terms of the next play, mining stocks, I know we're kind of joking here, but I'm a big fan of- I'm not joking. Uh, all this money that's flying into EVs and into green stuff, yeah. it's all using precious hard metals and they have to be mined. And so you start looking at that, those are the companies that are going to have recession-proof opportunities for at least until this climate change conversation goes into a different place. Yeah, I am a fan and you might shake your head at me a little bit here, but I'm a big fan of when I'm investing client money, I like sticking around basically just indexing. I, t I hang my hat a lot on doing the tax planning for clients. I see so oh, Wait a minute. Does that mean you're investing in the new fund, the inverse Jim Cramer? Have you seen this? I have. I There's have. an inverse Jim Cramer and I am this close to investing in it because that's going to knock the cover off the ball. It doesn't look like that'd be a bad call, I think. I think you might do all right with that. Oh, that dude is so wrong. And between following that and the Nancy Pelosi stock tracker on Twitter, I mean, you can get great financial ideas. Definitely. Definitely. Yeah. A lot of it too. It's funny. I mean, I guess I always I'm find... joking, y'all. There's an inverse Jim Cramer index out there. If you don't know what I'm talking about, then you should reach out to somebody as a financial advisor and ask them what they think about Jim Cramer. <laughs> there have been enough memes made about it saying just to do whatever he says. It was a matter of time until they came out with one. It's so funny. <laughs> ah. So anyway, um, so you do index funds because that way you can just kind of track along with it. Do you do the S&P or what do you, what do you index with? 
Yeah. Yeah. So I actually use ETFs because I have more tax control. They're ETFs. They buy and trade like stocks, basically, but you're able to get a wider spread of diversification in there at a lower cost, really. I use dimensional funds. They're local to Charlotte. They're over in South End there. And they do a great job of basically indexing, but also leaning a little bit more into the factors. Don't want to get too into the weeds on that today, but basically my reason for doing that is when I'm talking to business owners who who I'm working with and really have started to develop a niche in working with real estate professionals, it's because they have variable incomes. When I'm handling their money, it's when I'm dealing with ETFs, I'm able to buy and sell certain positions to maybe get them a tax loss in the year. I have clients who last year, you know, we were able to lock in huge tax losses where now that they're doing their tax returns, It's really helping them at tax time. Did they really experience that loss? No, not necessarily because we bought something similar and let the price come back up. But when you're a real estate professional with a variable income, it's so important where you're putting your money, what types of accounts, not asset allocation, but more asset location. If we have a 401k we need to put together for you to bring your taxes down or a Roth, if maybe you're having a bad year and we need to recognize some taxes, or if it's just money that, you know, maybe sitting in a bank account that's long-term money, investing it and being able to make some tax plays like I just described in some non-retirement accounts. It does get a little bit weedy there. So what do you say to somebody who has only been investing in their own personal real estate? Their income does fluctuate. That's obviously one of the biggest challenges for real estate professionals is they feel afraid of investing because they want to have the ability to weather through to the next transaction because they might go three months without a deal. And so they got to pay their bills. Mm -hmm. How do you get them started um, planning for retirement? Because it is a big challenge in our space that realtors don't tend to be ready for retirement. They don't have 401ks. They don't have any kind of forced savings. And so it's either what you're doing you have to be proactive on it or you're just counting on your primary residence because let's be honest, nobody can count on social security. And you look at the pension reform riots happening in France, we know they're going to have to do something here, but a real estate pro should be planning for not having to work until you're dead. And unfortunately, a lot of them are working far longer than they should have to for failure to plan. So where do you get people to start when they live in uncertainty and they still have some fear going on because the markets are so volatile? Yeah. And I'll start by saying the best thing about working with business owners, especially real estate professionals that are self-employed, is when we're looking at these, having this retirement conversation, we have the full spectrum of retirement accounts that we're able to use. When we're working with employees, I mean, typically whatever their employer gives them is pretty much what we have to work with. And we have to work within those confines. Working with someone who's self-employed, we get to put all of these benefits together, including their retirement plan. Uh, Really, what I focus on first is trying to make sure that we have, like we described earlier, that emergency fund cash balance there just to make sure that we have something that we aren't locking away until retirement. I don't want to recommend we do anything that's going to hold their money in another illiquid type investment that they can't access if they need it. We need to watch. what's What's your recommendation? Three months or six months of expenses for their emergency fund? It depends on the family. You know, I was talking with a family yesterday where they have two young kids. One of them is a real estate agent. He's relatively new. They happen to have six months in savings. And I said, let's leave it right there. Right. Uh, I'm a bigger fan of six months. Um, If it's someone who has a little bit more job security, maybe they've been in the business longer. I will veer down to three months, but typically I say six months. From that point, that's where it starts to get interesting and where it gets fun for me, because this is, if you think I've been in the weeds so far, this is where behind the scenes, the scenes I get really nerdy with this. But basically, I'm getting an income tax or a tax return from the previous year, asking the real estate professional how much they're on track to make this year so we can plan their income. If their income's up, we're putting that amount in a deferred retirement account, like a 401k that people are familiar with, trying to level out their income. If it's another 08 and their income dips down, that's a time where maybe we take those taxes that we deferred and recognize them then. Instead of their income tax bracket jumping all over the place where maybe they're in a, you know, they're paying 12% one year and then paying 37 the next, trying to level them out where maybe we just pay a flat 22%, ultimately pay less in taxes overall and make your just earnings experience just a lot less volatile. That's great to know, especially knowing that what we're looking at this year, we're expecting real estate incomes to come down just because there's less demand in the market. 
and we still don't have any supply. Plus, we have increased realtor competition. Our, our markets just keep growing with the number of realtors. So if somebody's expecting a decrease in income, there are still strategies they can utilize is what you're saying. There are. I see these as opportunity years, honestly. And as long as we have that cash flow built up that we discussed earlier, so the client, the real estate uh, professional doesn't have to be worried about covering their personal expenses. It's exciting because they start to see it as an opportunity as well. They start to get some of these taxes out of the way and they see in their financial plan what that means for their future. Um, That's kind of opposite what most people think. If the income's off, they don't want to talk to a financial planner because they think, ah, I don't have any money. There's no reason to call, but there's actually more reason to call. Kind of like you should buy low and most people want to buy high and sell low because they're following a herd mentality. So that's a great viewpoint. In fact, a good reason for you to call your real estate people who are afraid to call you, as I tell you to go prospecting because. Exactly. You're right. I mean, they need it. It's important. All right. So the agent who calls you, who's built up a brokerage and has built up a more solid business, and maybe they've been dropping $100 a month into a SEP or an IRA. So they put themselves on an automatic plan and now they've got a little bit more built up. What do you say is a next step for somebody that wants to really build over time? Because obviously people have different risk profiles. They're going to have different income profiles. But what do you say to a real estate professional? Because again, it doesn't matter how long you've been in, you're still going to have some volatility with income. But as you've already mentioned, some people have more of a cushion than others. Yeah, absolutely. And you mean next steps in terms of growing their business, in terms of their personal financial plans? Oh, it's all about the personal financial plan because your job is not to grow their business, but your job is to help them preserve their business by making sure they have a good financial foundation. I'd I'd say one of the top reasons that real estate agents get out of the business is they hit that financial bottom and they just can't stay in. They can't afford to stay in. And it just comes from not putting, not, not just the emergency fund, but a general lack of planning for the future. So where do you take them as a next step after they've gotten some basic things done? Do you talk to them about trust and do you go into, I've already mentioned the pass-through entities. I think any real estate agent who is paying the self-employment tax is doing themselves a huge disservice. And again, I no longer have my 763, 65. I'm not giving you financial advice, but you should totally be asking your CPA about that. So do you work with the CPA when it comes to those kind of decisions to help them get a holistic viewpoint? I do. I have some local CPAs that I work with and some virtual CPAs as well. Really, at this point, we're working with real estate professionals across the country. So I have plenty of clients that I've actually never met in person and they don't mind the same with their CPA. But I love being able to work with CPAs who are able, when I bring up the conversation of you were steering in this direction, but basically forming an LLC. And maybe it's time that we start to get out of those self employment taxes and start to tax ourselves as an S Corp as our income grows. That's a conversation that when I bring it up to a lot of, to some of my real estate professionals, they say, oh, that's that's funny. That's a conversation I hear in my brokerage. You know, we were having lunch together and I hear a lot of people around the table who, you know, I typically start to see once they reach about 50,000 of income, I start to see that conversation start to make sense. Below that, if they're very new. That's the perfect time to set it up. It always drives exactly. me crazy when somebody sets it up after they're making money, then they see the big tax bill and like, oh, you're like, well, if somebody had gotten you proactive, you could really do more things for yourself. But isn't that the story of financial investing is proactivity? I mean, everything you've said boils down to being proactive in your finances. Yeah, exactly. And another big thing that helps them feel more secure, they don't have any benefits. I mean, we're talking about just the retirement benefits here. I feel like a lot of times as a financial advisor, the conversation boils down to money management, but it really is so much more than that. If you are remotely awake, then you know that we are heading into some really tricky economic times. We have home buyers that have put the kibosh on buying because they have interest rate shock. We have sellers who have found out suddenly their houses aren't dipped in 14 karat gold. And as a realtor, you are still trying to keep up with the business you have and trying to answer questions in the meantime, while also managing 
sky high fuel cost at the pump. Never fear because my new video course is coming out right now and it's called How to Dominate During a Recession. Look, I've been a realtor for 22 years. I came through the last recession by the skin of my teeth, actually not even the skin of my teeth. My business went up every year during the Great Recession and it's all because of education and getting in front of the curve so that I could serve as many neighbors as possible and help them weather this storm as well. So this course is four modules. There might even be some bonus content for you. And I have priced it so that everybody can get a hold of it and go out there and do great things for the American dream and for home ownership. The price is $1.99. Click on this link. If you take action, you can be the one who brings great information and great solutions and also paired with realism and optimism into the marketplace that you serve. I am delighted to bring this out as quickly as possible because friends, there's no time like the present to make sure our neighbors are stronger and we protect the American dream. When you look at an, an employee benefit packet of someone who's employed, they've normally got some form of life insurance included from their employer. They've got some form of disability insurance. They might have health insurance. These are all important benefits to have the con- I mean, to have the conversation with the financial professional about as well. If they have a spouse that we can get those benefits through, that's great. If not, we pull up at least the minimum of what they need to feel secure in their plan and to make sure that if something were to happen to them or their ability to make an income, it's not going to impact their future negatively. So in North Carolina, we have association health care benefits, which every state should have that. And if you're in another state, let me know and I can connect you to our government affairs people who got that through in 2019, because that's been a huge benefit to our realtors here. But the rest of it, you're right. They don't think about the exterior pieces you really should have together in specific short term disability. I can't tell you how many realtors have broken a leg, turned an ankle. Something has happened. I mean, COVID happened to some people. They got so sick they couldn't work and short-term disability would have tapped in, but they never had it because it just didn't seem to be something that was talked about. I don't even think it's a lack of action. I think it's a lack of education. Exactly. So when you're sitting down with somebody the first time, is this the plan to go through like the the whole color wheel of we're going to talk about this piece and this piece and this one and this one so we can get the whole pie covered and Is that how you suck them in for the long haul? It is. Yeah, exactly. Get them relying on me. No, but really it is. I have them upload every piece of their financial life. I mean, they're uploading their home and auto insurance policies to me. Anything that their spouse might have, I'm looking at the full financial picture. And when I look at that, if I'm not able to save them money and show them that net of my fee, that this is going to be the right thing to do to work with me, I tell them what they need to do and they can go, you know, they can do it on their own. I want to be a value add, but I'm looking at their entire picture, any gaps that they might have in coverage, which I feel like really is underdone in my industry. I feel like a lot of times it's let's manage money and kind of, I don't think planning to ignore the rest, but it gets missed. And the reality is on that disability insurance, you're right. I mean, so many, especially real estate agents do become disabled. I mean, they're behind the wheel of their car and abnormally a large amount of time. They're walking properties they've never been in before. Yeah. High risk. Well, and you think about this picture too, is like, you've got to be able to spell everything across to get the long-term picture. And I love how you said uh, you add everything up net of those fees to show the value above and beyond what you charge, because That's one of the problems real estate agents have. They're afraid of admitting what they charge, even though they're absolutely worth it with what they provide in the way of counsel and value. But they forget to net that down and say, I'm spending these hours, this education, all of this to invest in being your best representative. So it's a wonderful phrase to lean into there. So let's go back to your friend, Alyssa. So she's two or three years in the business, which makes her somebody who's a survivor because in our business, 85% quit within the first two years. And so now she's made it to that survival point. What is your best advice for an early career realtor who is still obviously, that's when you experience the biggest peaks and valleys in your payment schedule and how your transactions operate. So what do you tell her for planning for the future? Because she's going to be at that stage in her career where she's investing more in marketing, more in websites, because she's got to establish her brand What's your best financial advice for somebody at that stage? 
Best advice there is to just start doing what you can. I mean, it's a muscle memory. I feel like when you let things go for too long, then you become the agent who's 10 years into their career, has the ability to do it all, but you never planned on it. You never built that muscle memory to know that, all right, this amount of money per month is going to come out of my account. I'm never going to see it, so I don't miss it. It's a much harder pill to swallow once your income has grown five times, 10 times what it is right now and you're seeing larger dollar amounts come out and you haven't planned on that to begin with. So the sooner you can start, the better. It's a good phrase. <laughs> you have to write that down because I like that because it also applies to investing in anything, whether it's political advocacy or financial retirement. Yeah. It's that muscle memory. But let me ask you a question. Since you're young, mm-hmm. y'all got little people in your house yet? We just had our daughter, Betty, in January, January 18th. Oh, you have a brand new in your house. Oh, that was part of the move to Greenville, too. Oh, you're getting real smiles now. You're hitting that two month mark. Oh, <laughs> yeah, yay. Yeah, it melts, melts our heart. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So and go ahead and have the next one, because the sooner you have them back to back, you won't even you won't even know. So. 529. Did you start one for your baby girl yet? Are you going to do that? What do you think about those 529 funds? So I'm going to start, I'm going to use a Roth. I typically like using a Roth IRA. You can use it in the parent's name and use it for retirement, or you can open one in the kid's name if you're self-employed and use it for their retirement. I see so often that parents aren't sure what their child's future is going to be, especially when they're a newborn. So why pigeonhole them into definitely going to college? And if they don't, then we have to take a penalty on our money with a 529, a Roth IRA, you put the money in there. If they don't decide to go to college, you're not penalizing them. They can still have the money and there's no penalty to take it out. They can use it for their retirement someday. So We're starting her with the Roth IRA. Admittedly, I've been absorbed by the baby smiles and haven't opened it for her yet, but it's on the way and it'll be there for her at whatever stage of her life she wants to use it. Which also means you have to update your will now to put Betty in your will. So what advice do you give real estate agents when it comes to that piece of planning? Do you have them think about the end of the life cycle, because you already mentioned like the fact that real estate agents, the idea of life insurance seems to escape them altogether. But I blame society for that because we just don't think about death as something that's inevitable. Everybody wants to cheat it and you cannot cheat the reaper. It's going to happen at some point. But we know that you've got to plan for these assets you're accumulating. Where are they going to go? I don't want the state to have it. They don't deserve what I've worked for. When do you work that into your conversation? Yeah. So it happens pretty early in. We get into the estate planning conversation just as we're setting up beneficiaries on accounts that I'm opening for them. And that gives me a good sense of how they want their assets to flow. Beyond there, we do get a little bit more direct with it and give a flow chart and show how things will currently go if something were to happen to them. An area that I see later on in life as agents build more, you know, become brokers, build more of their business is they don't really account for the fact that they are a business owner and something is going to end up happening to that business if something happened to them as well. So that's a really important piece that I I see is often forgotten, but you know, anyone who has started accumulating assets, anyone who's gotten married, anyone who's self-employed or has a kid needs to at least have a will or maybe a trust in place. And one other thing too, is when you see real estate professionals who own property in multiple states, they don't realize that if something were to happen to them, they could go into probate in multiple different states if they haven't planned maybe a trust accordingly. Wait a minute, wait a minute. So I'm in North Carolina and I have a North Carolina will but I own property in Texas. Do I have to have a separate codicil to my will because of that property in Texas? It's going to go to probate or it will just work through my regular will? Not to keep hitting you with the disclosures, but technically we should be talking to an attorney on this. So take my advice just as a friend, but you should in that situation, that would probably become a trust situation so they don't have to go through each state probate. I see a lot of times with us being in the Carolinas, I see North Carolina or South Carolina residents who own maybe a beach house in the other state. They don't realize they're really exposing themselves to maybe going through probate in both states and really delaying those assets passing on to their family. So long story short, you need a whole team with your real estate pro and your certified financial planner and your CPA and your attorney and your insurance agent. So you have to have a team. And frankly, that's because none of us needs to know everything in life. We need to know who to call, though, which is half the battle. So what's the biggest mistake you've ever seen somebody make? Now, obviously, 
you've talked to people in all kinds of financial scenarios. They came from a foundation. They came from nothing. And you can't use the lack of starting. That's an obvious mistake. Give us something you saw somebody do and you're like, are you for real? Come on, people. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, you know, my response was almost more when one of these things happens, you know, you feel bad for them and wish you'd met them sooner to be able to to save them from this. But this was actually just last year. And I actually just got off the phone about 30 minutes with this guy before getting on this call today. I've built a good relationship with him and I really enjoy following everything that he's doing in his real estate investing. But he was working with another financial advisor previously, and he had built a terrible decision, right? Across what was the- he thinking? <laughs> um, he was working with another financial advisor. He had opened up a retirement account and built up a pretty good balance in that retirement account. He also did some real estate investing, and he saw a property he had to have. He decided that he needed to use his retirement money to buy the real estate. So what did he do? He pulled the money out of his retirement account to buy the real estate. When you do that, you get hit with huge income taxes because it was a deferred tax account, like a 401k, basically, he'd been saving in. He didn't realize he wasn't told by his advisor that there are the self-directed accounts that you could move that retirement money into an account and invest directly in the real estate while still keeping it retirement money and not getting hit with the tax blow. So, ah, man, just a lot of times, just lack of knowledge. A lot of advisors that work for some of these larger institutions, they can't help you with the self-directed accounts to free up your money to invest in things like real estate. And frankly, they might not even know they exist. So this client took a huge tax hit to make an investment that he didn't necessarily need to to pay the taxes on at that point. So does that financial planner have to be held accountable for that? Is he culpable for the mistake by not telling this guy or is it all caveat emptor in your side of the world? No. So there's two sides of our business. There are fiduciaries who basically are registered with either the SEC or registered with their state. They don't work for a broker dealer. They work exclusively for their clients. And then there are advisors who work with broker dealers and they are technically employed. I won't say any names, but these would be You drive down the street and see the advisor buildings with a well-known company name on it, for example. Their loyalty is owed to their company. You're not responsible for being a fiduciary and acting in your client's best interest unless you work for the client as a fiduciary, as my firm does. And that's why I did what I did and started my company. You're not responsible for helping clients move money out of accounts from your employer if you work for one of these broker dealers because you need to work in in really in their best interest. It just has to be a suitable recommendation on that side. So to answer your question, that was long-winded. No, no penalties there against the advisor. He didn't hurt his employer. He just didn't act in the best interest of the client in that situation. Well, that bites, but that means a good question to ask if you're watching or listening to this and you're trying to figure out if you have the right financial advisor or not, ask them who they're working for. I mean, you really should know that answer. Just like in real estate, we have a conversation all the time with our buyers and sellers to make sure they understand that we operate as a fiduciary. North Carolina, you're either working for the buyer or the seller. You're working for both as a dual agent. South Carolina has another setup with transaction agents where you actually represent the transaction, which doesn't make you a fiduciary to either party. And so you have to know who the loyalties are owed to. So you have good questions to ask. I mean, I bet this guy was furious when he found out that he could have had better counsel, but he didn't. And then you feel kind of trapped by that because you didn't know which questions to ask. And so it's a lack of education on everybody's part that could be made better. Well, you see who he's working with now and we have a great relationship. So hopefully that is now he knows the difference. (laughs) Exactly. Exactly. It was a very expensive lesson. Exactly. Yeah. And unfortunately, the vast majority of advisors work under a broker dealer employer because it's easier to get started there. I mean, to give everyone credit, I started under that model. And I did good work, but I worked for Well, they're gone now, but I worked for Prudential Securities, but that's a long time ago. 
It's actually, I started with Prudential also. Did you? Oh, yeah. they got, they got eight. They were a great company. Yeah. They really were. I can't say anything bad about Prudential. You know, I really enjoyed working there. It was just needed to be able to have a little more flexibility to change my model. And as long as I'm going to be in this business, I'm still relatively early in my career. I wanted to begin with the end in mind and build that muscle memory under my new business models. All right. So as we wrap up our conversation here, did you have any other advice or pithy things you wanted to share with our audience before you tell them how they can reach out to you if they have additional questions or want to pick your brain? Yeah, just basically anyone. I know there's a lot of changes in being your own business owner. And obviously, a lot of this call has been around the real estate professionals who are their own business owners from investment planning. Maybe you had an old 401k that's been left behind. Tax planning. You have a variable income now. Benefits planning around the insurance. If you have any questions, please feel free to consider me and my company, Sound Wealth Management, a resource. And of course, all of Greg's contact information, handles and links and phone numbers is in the show notes for this episode. So if you're sweating to the oldies or just riding down the road, Don't stress out and try to write it down. Just go to the show notes and you can pull everything up. Greg, thank you so much for coming on the show and giving us some insights into some different angles and aspects. And hopefully everybody's got a new question or two to ask of their own advisors. Thank you, Lee. Thanks for all you do for the industry. I appreciate it. All right, guys, make sure that you say something nice about Greg in the comments or ask him a question and then we'll stalk him and see if he comes back to answer them. Most importantly, subscribe and come back and we'll find out what we talk about next time over here on Crazy Shit. So if you found value in this episode, please like and subscribe to this channel, turn on the bell and catch another amazing episode by clicking above. Crazy Shit in Real Estate is also available on all of your normal podcast apps. So if that's where you like to hang out, go find me, click subscribe. And most importantly, leave me a review that says you think I'm awesome, my guests are awesome, or this content is just exactly what you were looking for. And then by the way, if there's something you need, you wanna learn about something, you can comment below anytime. You can also send me a direct message if you need to remain anonymous, no judgment. But anyway, I'll only judge if you forget to subscribe and click. I'll see you next time.